We've seen molecules getting into the cell by diffusion, and we've seen channel proteins and carrier proteins assisting polar molecules. In all three of these cases, it is passive transport because it doesn't require the input of energy as long as the molecules are moving along their concentration gradients. In other words, from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. But life is not always an easy downhill roll. Our cells often need to move molecules against their concentration gradients, and to do that requires the input of energy. Active transport is what we call transport against a concentration gradient, and it requires energy. The energy source for moving molecules against their concentration gradient is usually ATP or adenosine triphosphate. Certain transport proteins embedded in the bilayer can use ATP energy to maintain a concentration gradient. And one example is found prominently in our nerve cells, and it's the sodium-potassium pump. The sodium-potassium pump starts by loading in three sodium ions from the cytoplasm in the active site of the protein. Note that the sodium concentration in the cytoplasm starts out lower than the sodium concentration outside the cell, and the potassium concentration is low outside the cell and high inside. With the hydrolysis of ATP, that third phosphate group is attached to the protein, which causes it to change shape. The sodium ions are then released outside the cell, where sodium concentration is high and just got a little higher. Then, two potassium cations on the outside of the cell may find their way into the transporter protein, which causes the phosphate group to dissociate from the molecule, and the transporter changes shape again. This shapeshift releases the potassium cations into the cytoplasm, making potassium concentration inside the cell even higher. As the potassium leaves the transporter, we are back where we started, and the molecule is ready to shift more sodium outside the cell. Now, on the face of it, this is a very confusing process. Why is the cell increasing concentration of two concentrated ions and not equally? Three sodiums traded for two potassiums? Why exert energy on this? Last question first. Why exert energy on this? Because simple and facilitated diffusion won't do this job. As you can see, these types of transport only work with their concentration gradients. The T leaves the bag, but it doesn't return. In active transport, we can move things up their concentration gradients. Or, in another analogy, water will run downhill with no input of energy. Gravity does the work. But to get water to go uphill, you need a pump, and that pump requires an energy source. So, back to the other questions about the sodium-potassium pump. Why pump ions against their gradient at all? And why an unequal proportion? Ion pumps, like the sodium-potassium pump, have the job of creating a membrane potential, or voltage, across a membrane. You've probably heard of voltage and are aware that it has something to do with electricity, but what? Electricity is essentially a special case of a concentration gradient. Specifically, it is a charge gradient. When you put a battery in something, you have a stored electric charge gradient. Electrons are stored on one side, and they would really, really, really like to get to the other side. So much so that we can ask those electrons to perform all kinds of tricks for us before we allow them to get to the other side. We can ask them to brush our teeth, or send cat videos to our friends, or express our thought in a neatly typed text. Power the spark plugs to make our cars burn gasoline efficiently. Anything electrical. But our cells are using the same idea, only coupled with a second force, the chemical gradient force, which together form the electrochemical force. And using ATP to exaggerate both the ion difference across the membrane and the charge difference across the membrane allows the cell to do cellular work. Like, for example, for nerve cells to transmit signals from the brain to some typing fingers, or to a speaking voice or from an ear to another brain, just as examples. Cells use ATP as an energy source, but cells also produce electricity. Not in an exploitable way, unfortunately, but in much the same way as a smartphone or a laptop. 
That is what the sodium-potassium pump is for animal cells, while other organisms use a different electrogenic pump, the proton pump. We'll also see how a proton pump can be used to make ATP in chapters 9 and 10. The last topic for this chapter on membranes is bulk transport. Small molecules can enter or leave the cell passively without the input of energy as long as they are going along their concentration gradient from high concentration to low concentration. But moving large molecules into or out of a cell, even if it's along the concentration gradient, requires energy, and we call this bulk transport. Exocytosis is moving large molecules outside the cell, and endocytosis is moving large molecules in. We've seen exocytosis before, but we didn't have a proper name for it then. As cells secrete hormones, for example, they pack vesicles full of the large molecules and then fuse them to the plasma membrane. We've also had a little taste of endocytosis, such as the process of forming a food vacuole that can fuse to lysosomes. The process looks similar, though the proteins involved in the process are not the same. Endocytosis can be divided into three categories, phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. Phagocytosis means cell eating. In phagocytosis, a cell senses and engulfs a particle in a vacuole. This vacuole fuses with a lysosome to digest the particle, such as we see in this amoeba that is engulfing a bacterium that appears to be about as big as it is. Pinocytosis means cell drinking. In pinocytosis, vesicles are formed not around particles, but rather molecules are taken up when extracellular fluid is gulped, as you can see in the picture. Receptor-mediated endocytosis is the most complex in appearance. In this process, the surface of the cell has receptor proteins, like signal transduction molecules that we saw earlier in this chapter. Those receptors bind molecules which are generally called ligands. When a critical number of ligands are bound to receptors, that signal that is received in the cell says, let's form a vesicle. Proteins bound to the inside of the membrane, called coat proteins, start to poke inwards, or invaginate, to form a coated pit and eventually a coated vesicle. Here's an analogy. The receptors are like fish traps set by a fisherman, and the ligands would be the fish he's trying to catch. But the fish are small and delicious, so he doesn't want to waste energy pulling in empty traps for these tiny delicacies. So the coat proteins function like flags that are flipped upwards when a trap catches a fish. The fisherman will wait until he sees that enough flags are flipped to make it worth his while to haul in the catch. And the coated vesicle is a rich trove of delicious little fish. Helpful? So again, in all of these forms of endocytosis and exocytosis, or bulk transport, Molecules and particles are moving with their concentration gradients, but these methods still require energy. In the next chapter, we'll talk more about how cells manage their limited energy resources. Again, learning objectives, part one, and two, and thus, we close this chapter.